новый храм святителя Николая. В его освящении, которое провел архиепископ Сурожский Елисей, приняли участие 20 священников. Священники приходов Сурожской епархии, представители поместных православных церквей и русской зарубежной церкви в Великобритании и Ирландии. На освящении храма присутствовали мэр Оксфорда с супругой, представители англиканской и римско-католической церквей. После освящения храма архиепископ Елисей совершил в нем первую божественную литургию. Русский час встретился с настоятелем храма, отцом Стивеном Платтом. Father Red Cross on the field of white, the standard of England. After all, Russia has been already together with Scotland flying the St. Andrew flag, which is both the Scottish standard and the Russian naval ensign. Yes, and of course, the flag of St. George is significant to Muscovites because St. George appears on the crest, on the shield of the city of Moscow. Although St. George, as patron of England, is a little later. Um, The, the, the fact is that for us Orthodox living in this country, it is significant that Britain was an Orthodox country for a thousand years before the division of Christianity. Our church here is ancient. Uh, the gospel arrived here in these islands with the apostles. Church tradition tells us how Some of the closest followers of Christ came here to preach the gospel and even were martyred on these shores. It's significant perhaps that Britain was a Christian country for hundreds of years before Prince Vladimir um, accepted the gospel and was baptized with the nation of Rus uh, into the Christian faith. It's also significant um, that the sanctity of our many saints and holy places, I believe, goes very, very deep. We uh, cannot pretend that for many people in Britain this is even recognized or known, because like Russia, Britain really suffers from many of the um, effects of um, pluralism, Um, and um, post-Christian uh, um, secular um, uh, society. We live in a very consumeristic society as well here. In this respect, there isn't that much difference between the situation here and the situation in Russia. And the same is true that in this situation, the faith of the undivided church And the simple Christian life of the early British saints who bore witness to it is, I believe, potentially of great um, help and significance to a society which, in spiritual terms, many would think has lost its way. Uh, officially, Britain is still a Christian country. The bishops of the Church of England still sit in the Parliament, for instance, in the House of Lords. Um, the monarch, the Queen, officially is the head of the Church of England. But how much this Christian witness, actually, this Christian um, official um, uh, status, actually has, uh, uh, how much impact that has on the life of average people here, um, I think is debatable. Perhaps the religious uh, group which has the loudest voice in Britain is often not even the Christians at all, but the Muslims, who are not afraid to shout about their faith. Perhaps we as Orthodox need to rely on the certainty and the sureness in the um, faith of the gospel of those early British saints. Um, And then um, our own life of Christian witness will start to have an impact. But there's something else here. The early British saints lived 
not only a very uh, orthodox and very traditional church life, but in terms of their own life of prayer, it was very simple. It was not um, full of uh, rich things, or it wasn't concerned with uh, outward appearance or outward um, uh, richness, but with inward spiritual beauty. And as Father Barnabas, my uh, late and uh, spiritual father, used to say, if the British people are to accept Orthodox Christianity, it will have to prove to them first that it is pure, simple Christianity, the Christianity of the Gospel. Uh, Father Stephen, many see Vladika Yelisey of Suraj as an archbishop who is fully establishing the Russian Church in Britain now. As someone who served under the aegis of uh, Venerable Metropolitan Antony, uh, can you please tell us more about Archbishop Yelisey as a hierarch? Archbishop Yelisey is first and foremost a prayerful person. Um, I remember when he arrived, uh, one should speak honestly about these sort of things. Um, of course, when any new bishop arrives, um, there is a deal of speculation and hesitation and um, uh, worry because nobody knows what to expect. Uh, but people were very much um, impressed by the prayerfulness of Archbishop Elysee. When he celebrates at the Divine Liturgy, one is aware of somebody who is really praying. And this took me right back to uh, Metropolitan Antony. There is the same degree of discipline around the altar as when Metropolitan Antony celebrated, although the style of the celebration is quite different. Uh, Metropolitan Antony was not a great lover of the full um, hierarchical uh, order for celebrating the Divine Liturgy. We would only celebrate the Achirieske Služba, the, the, the bishop's service for the liturgy, once a year on the on the Pistoni Praznik, on, on the, the, the patronal feast of the cathedral. And because we only celebrated the um, uh, bishop's service once a year, we always forgot how to do it and it was always a little chaotic. But normally speaking, when Metropolitan Antony celebrated the liturgy, he would not tolerate any lack of discipline in the church. In the altar and in the church as a whole, he insisted on absolute silence. There must be no talking in the church. Archbishop Elysee, I notice when I am called to celebrations in the cathedral, has around him the same degree of prayerful and disciplined prayer life. It's something which is very impressive. Father Stephen, uh, can you please tell us more about the British Orthodox saints and their significance for the Orthodoxy world over, not just in Britain? Yes, um, the British Orthodox saints uh, the saints of Britain uh, before the um, Norman period, roughly speaking, before the division of Eastern and Western Christ Christendom, Eastern and Western Christianity, um, um, are very numerous. We have hundreds of local saints um, in uh, the uh, countries which are now England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland, and all of the British Isles. Some of these saints are well known throughout the world. One can think of St. Patrick. There's even an Irish St. Patrick Day's Parade which is well known in Moscow these days. Other saints are not even well known in Britain outside of their own places where they lived, but there are still very many of them. Um, a couple of years ago, the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church uh, blessed the celebration of the uh, synaxis, of the, the feast of the Sabor, of all of the British saints to take place on the um, third Sunday after, uh, after Trinity, after Pentecost. In fact, this was simply confirming what we have been doing here for many years, keeping a celebration of all of our local saints. But amongst these saints, one should mention uh, certain people. Our first martyr, St. Alban, there is a town in Britain, St. Albans, named after him, was already a Roman soldier. Uh, he was a Roman Christian 
who he had been baptized by a priest who was traveling through the country baptizing people into the Christian faith. And when the authorities came looking for the priest, the story tells us that St. Alban disguised himself as the priest so that the priest could escape. And when he was brought before the authorities, he revealed his true identity and he refused to sacrifice to idols and so he was martyred, he was beheaded, becoming our first martyr here um, in the um, uh, second century. Um, um, so, or, or, or the third century. There is a confusion over the date, there is a debate over the date. So our church is the church founded already on the blood of the martyrs. But then our local church here, our local church life, includes a very, very strong monastic uh, dimension. St. Patrick, St. David of Wales, uh, St. Columba, St. Aidan, all of these early monastic saints of the 5th, 6th, 7th centuries learned their monastic life originally from the monks of the Orthodox East. Um, their monasticism is Orthodox in character and this is confirmed by archaeological evidence now when the archaeologists tell us that um, patterns that appear on metalwork and pottery from their monasteries are the same as the patterns that come from the deserts of Egypt and Syria. So it's true that there were connections between the Orthodox East and the Orthodox West. The ancient world was perhaps much smaller than we like to imagine. People knew what each other was doing and they prayed for each other and they were in a prayerful communion with each other. Um, of course, the history of our early church life here is uh, recorded by our own chronicler, St. Bede, St. Bede of Jarrow, who wrote the history of the English church and people. And it's curious that he is for us here rather like an English nester. Um, and the kind of stories that he writes are very similar in their um, sound and in their character to the stories that Nestor tells in his chronicle as to how uh, Russia uh, developed its own life of faith and national identity. We as Russian Orthodox who are not only Russian by nationality or background feel both the presence of our British local saints but also the presence of the great Russian saints that we have come to know and love and we feel that they're as much our own saints so that when you walk into our church here you'll see side by side the icons of British saints St Alban, the icon of the saints of Britain the icon of St Friedswied, our local saint here in Oxford side by side with St Seraphim of Sarov uh, um, uh, St. Tichon of Moscow, St. Xenia of St. Petersburg, St. Matrona and so on. The saints of these different parts of the undivided church stand side by side uh, praying for us. So this is a sort of paradigm, a sort of image of what our church life can be here uh, in our local situation. Father Stephen, thank you very much for the interview and I can attest to the fact that one can feel that grace, that presence that you've been just telling us about. And I will urge anybody who is in Oxford to come and experience that for themselves here. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
Очередной выпуск передачи «Русский час» подошел к концу. До свидания. Goodbye.